Let's uh, have a look at Daphne and Chloe by Ravel, one of the most beautiful solos of the flute literature uh, from the orchestra. Um, this is a pantomime, uh, so it's uh, the sleeping uh, Chloe is there lying on a rock and Daphne is trying to wake her up by dancing around her and by um, bringing her back to, back to life after she's been uh, taken away um, by pirates. And then, then Daphne's managed to find her back and she was brought back there. And once she wakes up after this solo, it ends in a general dance with everybody happy and this is the final part of, the, of Daphne's and Chloe ballet. This is also part of the concert suite number two, which is the, basically the, the last a uh, bit of the, of the ballet by Ravel. And it's a very rewarding solo to play, actually. The first run uh, says E sharp, or actually it says e, e natural in the score of the conductor, but since it's, uh, it is corrected to E natural in the second bar, it implies automatically that the previous bar must have been a sharp. And this is why there, um, there is an inconsistency between the score and the, and the individual parts about this. Also in Ravel's own piano version of the piece, there's both a D sharp and an E sharp in that run going up. So be prepared to play anything that the conductor requests you to do. I've always been uh, playing um, the, what is actually printed in the flute part. So with the E natural, except on my day of the audition at the Berlin Philharmonic where I messed up the scale. And I played something like this, probably, that was not really accurate. It was a, one of the few mistakes that I allow, allowed myself to, to play on that day. Um, and of course, it never happened again in any rehearsal, any recording session or any concert, but just on the very day of the audition, it had to be. Nevertheless, I was the one to get the job. So you don't have to play perfect, you just have to play convincingly <laughs> and uh, to show that you know what you're doing and that you, you're really expressing something. But uh, you're not, never going to miss a job because you played an E sharp uh, instead of an E natural or because you messed up just one place uh, by accident during an audition, because people can tell, the, the panel can tell the difference between an accident or somebody who just doesn't know his piece. Uh, you can be sure about that. Now, the whole thing being a ballet, you have to think in your mind, you have to use your imagination and think of all the gestures uh, that can be uh, happening and that can be done. You have to be your own ballet director in this, uh, in this uh, section, and even on the long notes, you have to drive them with colors, and you can have the same note with a crescendo, and then turn it around, and then the same notes on the other side. It's like the light uh, and the earth turn turning like this on itself. Around the sun, we have night and day and season, etc., but it's all the same process, basically. And it's exactly what's happening here with the notes. Uh, by playing a different harmony, for one brum, for one brum. That's the rhythmical texture uh, for the dancer, uh, for the for this uh, for this whole section here. And for us on the brum, so on the second eighth notes of every bar, uh, there's a change of harmony. Well, not on every bar. In some bars, it stays the same, and then there's a development there. And depending on how the development is, it's going to be a brighter color. It's going to be a lighter color. It's going to be a darker color. Um, and all of this sh uh, throws a different light or a different shade on the, on the note that we're actually uh, currently playing. This is uh, why every time a bar is repeated in the flute, it comes with a different accompaniment. Uh, when we have, for instance, It comes a second time as a triplet, as a decoration, uh, as a variation of the first time, but then it comes also with a harmonic evolution in the piano part. But actually the weirdest place is yet to come in the bar just after this. Could, could we play one, two, three, four, five, six before uh, 178? <laughs> So for two bars before this, we had the weirdest harmony of the entire piece. 
Let's play just the one, two, three, four bars before 78. This is a very friendly harmony that we have been having for a while. And suddenly, whoosh, it's like a laser light on, on the flute player, basically, but uh, light th thrown by the orchestra. You didn't do anything as a flute player, but suddenly it's the place that has the diminuendo, actually, and that is, this, that is the, uh, it's the spot where you get the harmony you expected the least there, and there's a great change of color that, that has to happen. This is why Ravel writes, retenu légèrement, slightly slowed down, um, ritenuto, so that you have the time to get this chord to vroom, and give it the space uh, to fill the hole, even though it's going to be the, the softest dynamic there. And from there, we're going to take it again with the next bar. back to the other harmony, very relaxed, like we were then in the beginning, suddenly it's a wow. And then suddenly it feels so, comf so comfortable and warm at the same time, yet we have to play with a triple piano on the top D and we have to fetch it as far as we can in our, in our imagination. And note that it's beyond anything that we've been able to think of uh, before until we had the joy of playing this music in the orchestra. And this is why it's so rewarding because we can really take all the time of the world to reach that note as far as we can in terms of dynamics and expression, as if it comes from a different world, you know. Uh, it's, this is really the big, the big challenge of this piece, is to really let your imagination flow as freely as possible, yet having this boom, bum, bram, boom, bum, bram. I'm always asking the conductors to be as steady as possible with the boom, bum, so that then I can surf around this, I can rubato around this, and there is a base, there is a pace to work around and to work with or to work against. If uh, they start accompanying too much and trying to match perfectly what you, what you are doing, then the mystery of the whole music and the whole arabesque feeling of all these runs around the notes and all these rhythmical complications then becomes um, mathematical, geometrical, and you can imagine the dancer going like with square motions like this, which is not at all the expression that is supposed to be there. It's really supposed, something supposed to be really flexible, uh, expressive et souple are the words by Ravel right in the beginning. Let's play this.
etc. This is <laughs> how you connect the first and the second flute, basically. You have to use a little bit of a circular breathing to, to, to do this uh, in that spot. Um, I've been playing this uh, with, um, with many different conductors. Basically, it's up to the flute player to determine which tempo you want to have. And I think most of them are pretty flexible and uh, not, not too... Um, not imposing so much the tempo, basically, on the, on the flute player. The danger is to get slower and slower and slower every time that we have to take time for... Then it slows down the tom, pom, prom, da ga da ga da ga da ga for the first run, and then... The danger also to push every note, don't do this. This is the same figure, just going da -di -da -da, hesitating in the beginning, da -di -da -da -di -da 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 and then bouncing on the ram. It's like the dancer doing a pirouette, uh, jumping in the air and falling on their feet again, and, and just dum and, and bouncing and da -di -da -da -da, but very ethereal and very uh, suspended in the way that we phrase these things. We have to to, to keep it as less. Um, uh, we have to keep it as light as possible and not ground it to earth on every possible downbeat. This, all of this is absolutely not required for this. Something that's much more floating and, and, uh, and horizontal and gives a texture for the singer. We're literally playing what the, sing the, what the dancer is dancing um, there, as opposed to what the orchestra with the palm. Prom. Prom is actually doing with a rhythmical uh, movement there. It just keeps us, it reminds us of the, the, um, the time passing by, basically. It gives us, gives us a pace, but we have to be within that pace to be as free and uh, the way we evolve as, as possible. Yet we have to be accurate in the, in the relationships between the, the 30 second notes, the sextuplet of 30 seconds, the triplets of 16th, and the 16 notes also. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. But not one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. It should not be mathematic, it should not be pedagogical in the way um, this piece is played. It should be feeling as if it's floating, but should actually be totally uh, in control of the time. Also, when we get to the middle section, There's the change of key from the major to the minor, or the minor to the major, and then backwards again to the, to the minor. I think we can l give the color also there. It's like you have a black and white picture, you bring in some color, and then you bring it bl to black and white. Could we try maybe just two bars before 177? No, four bars before. For this trill, 
we have to use the regular fingering of E flat. So we're with all fingers pressed down, basically, and lift up the three fingers of the left hand, which is pre a really easy thing to do because we have to keep, just to keep the three fingers together. That's the easiest motion we can do. If they had to work against each other, it would be really tricky. But this way they just stick together. And what I do is I grab at the same time just a very little bit with my middle finger of this hand, I grab a little bit of the trill key and open it by a fraction so that the sound of the interval for the trill is a, is a proper and decent one. Otherwise, it's a bit too flat. <laughs> the F sounds good if you just grab a little bit of that key by, lift, by taking it together with the, the middle finger of the right hand. It works for me because I have big, large fingers. Of course, if you have very thin fingers that just are, uh, have trouble covering the whole of the instrument, don't even try to do it because you won't be able to do it. And you will have to, to get away with, a, with a, the, the trill that's a little bit out of tune with the regular finger. It's a much better, much nicer, equal uh, tone on both notes of the trill. When you play a trill, always think that there are two notes. There's the upper note and there's the, the lower note. It's not just one note and the other one is whatever. Uh, there's always two notes and you really have to think and focus a lot about the other note that is not the, main, the, not the main note of the trill because we have a tendency to forget them and it gives a lot more brilliance to the trill when we really make it alive because of the two components that are in there. Would you like to have a try and play this solo together with Tanya?